the two times I got punched in the face were things I didn't write. So both times I was like, what the fuck, man? Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Before we start, I started running an ad on my Instagram account with the list of episodes I've done. So if you started following the Instagram account, can you just message me and say that's how you found me? Because I'm trying to see if this ad works because it seems like I'm getting more followers because of it. So I want to put more money into it if I could see that it's really gaining traction and people are finding this podcast because of the ad. So please go do that. You'd be awesome. This episode is a repost of episode 62 with my interview with Travis Keller from Buddyhead. The reason I'm doing this is for two reasons. One is I'm trying to do three episodes on one off, meaning that I'm trying to do three episodes and then take like a Friday off. But I want to take advantage of that fourth Friday every month because podcast services will only keep the current 100. So I've got like a huge backlog of episodes and they're all on my website and this was the scene.com. But I don't think a lot of people like to listen to podcasts by going to a website and I've been gaining a lot of new followers. So I figured this is a great way to reintroduce old episodes to people who just started listening And uh, so I'm just kind of just like choosing which ones to put out there. So we will see how it goes. This episode was a really fun episode. I thought it was cool too because Buddyhead was such a funny fucking website back in the day. And it was so controversial because they did really crazy shit. I was able to find Travis because someone sent me a link before I got the interview to his Instagram account, American Primitive, which is American Primo if you're looking for it on Instagram. So I reached out to him to see if he'd want to talk. And he said yes. And this is what we chat about. Meeting people through his photography, calling Dave Navarro, how they got so many phone numbers, living in Tarzana, the Icarus line, the transplants not digging one of the posts, Fred Durst, is he still down with the buddy head name following him, drive through records, and a ton more. You can check out his latest project, American Primitive, at AmericanPrimitive.org, or you can go to his Instagram account, like I just said. And if you need an explainer video to explain what your company does, you can check out my website, Drive80.com, drive com. I do explainer videos, logo animations, and Instagram stickers, and that's how I make a living. So if you want to support the podcast, you can hire me and pay me money, and uh, that will support the podcast. That's all I got to say, so feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some punk rock nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. Thanks for taking the time to talk, man. Yeah, man. Thanks uh, thanks for having me on. Um, Actually, I was looking through your Instagram. I was really surprised because it's like I felt... It's like very, it's cool because you have all these photos, which I'm guessing you took back, like, it's, you know, you took all these back in like the late 90s and 2000, right? Yeah, a lot of them. Yeah. So, some of them are later. Like there's, there's even stuff I took this year and stuff. And there's like stuff when I was on tour with Nine Inch Nails, like in, you know, 2005, 2007. Holy shit. But uh, yeah, I mean, it kind of varies, but like a lot of the ones, especially the ones I've been posting lately, just because the way I do is I'm like going through this like massive archive of negatives that like for 20 years i was just like i'll organize that shit later and it just became like this massive pile of crap and i don't know what's there so i've just been like kind of trying to organize it and it's kind of why i started making the zines and uh i've just been going through and that's kind of the era like 97 to like 2000 it's kind of just the era lately i've been hitting a lot for whatever reason but uh that's kind of when i first moved to la and started taking photos and it's kind of how i like met everyone really was with my camera yeah i mean i think it's like the best way to do it when people it's like if you go up to someone and ask them for something they're usually like what but if you kind of give them some value they're super stoked on it you're like hey i took some pictures they're like holy shit yeah yeah i mean and for me too it was just like always kind of like a defense mechanism like i mean i came from skateboarding so documentation was like super important you know it was like that's just kind of like I just came from the mentality that you filmed everything or documented everything, but also it was just kind of like a defense mechanism because I was so shy, you know, and I wanted to be around that shit. But um, that was just kind of like my way in, you know. And um, are you going? I see the one from Avail. Are you going to that show at all? Are you gonna fly out for the reunion? No, no, I don't. I don't really go to a lot of, re- especially if I've already like seen it. It's like I don't know. I guess if I happen to be there, I might check it out, but. I'm not like going out of my way to like fly anywhere. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Especially like if I already saw it, like 20, I mean, it wouldn't mean the same to me. Like I don't really listen to like that type of music really uh, yeah. that often. Yeah. Some, I've seen a bunch of reunion shows in the last decade when it was just started to kind of 
it was slowly starting to happen. It was actually more than a decade, like when Lifetime got back together and it was just, mm. you know, that was like 2006, but that was, it was totally worth it because I never got to see them back in the day, but to see that show was, it, it felt like it was like the late 90s, even though it was pretty, you know, like 2006 wasn't too far mm-hmm. from then. But um, yeah, what I was looking through, it was just funny because I just, you know, from knowing all the buddy head stuff, which we're going to like get into, um, there's such a positive vibe. And I, don't take that the wrong way, but I figured like your your tone is very just like you're just up from what the buddy head stuff. You're just very upfront, and um, it just felt like it was so different. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I've grown up a lot since since then. You know, just because I've I've gotten older and like lived through shit or whatever. But uh, you know, uh, uh, let's see, what's the best? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think I've just like grown up a lot, really. You know. Um, and also, like, Buddy Head, even though it was, like, negative and poking fun at people, it came from, like, a genuine place of love. Like, we, we like, knew what we liked. And, like, it was kind of like our religion, like, music and art and all that shit. So, to us, it, it, it just, like, we were just being, like, I mean, at the same time, it, like, entertained us. Do you know what I mean? Like, we weren't, like, trying to, like, ruin anyone's lives or, like, be dicks. You know what I mean? I mean, I guess maybe be dicks. But, like, you know what I mean? Like, we weren't, like, there was no, like, malicious... You know, it was all out of a place of love for the most part, you know? Yeah, it seemed like it was like a passion for something. And if you saw that anything was fucking with it, you were like standing up for it in a way. Yeah, and I think that's just how you react to things, too, when you're like really young, you know? Yeah. Um, so it was funny. I, the reason I, I reached out was I was doing I, it was like an interview that just launched like last week. Um, you, you, Buddy had came up a bunch of times and it's through these conversations with people when we're talking about anything, there's always a mention of something from back then, like a zine or like maximum rock and roll and just a random label. So I'm like, shit, I should reach out. And then you guys came up a bunch. That's cause cool. I, yeah. Cause I think I messaged you cause there was a story I told and I want to, <laughs> before I jump in, I want to know if it was true. It was the, um, I think I messaged you about that whole John Mayer thing. Is that, is that how we started? I don't it, know. You have to... it, it was like, shit, I don't remember. <laughs> so I remember, I think I remembered, because you guys were really famous for posting people's phone numbers or email addresses, and you were like, hey, give them a call or send them an email and say this or something. And yes, I heard a story you did, you posted like John Mayer's cell phone, and it was, I think, and I'm paraphrasing, but it was like, hey, here's John Mayer's cell phone, give him a call and tell him his, his mom's body's a wonderland. <laughs> is that is that true? Yeah, that sounds, that sounds about right. <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> we so many of those that it's like it's really hard to keep track of them all. But that that one sounds like that sounds legit. I think I remember that one. Yeah, I was looking through an archive thing to try to pick up the website, and uh, it does come up, but it can't really go through it. So like we we used to call Dave Navarro like every day, and it, it was fun because he used to pick up like nine times out of ten, and it was me and my friend Joe Burns from Philadelphia. So we would kind of call him in like rounds. You know, I would like text him and be like, I just called him and told him this. You know, or like. <laughs> Or we would even hear through people, like people that we know that like were out like in the music scene or clubs or whatever. They knew that we did this, and they'd be like, "Yo, he was he's just leaving like the Troubadour or whatever." And we'd call him and be like, "Dave, we're at the Troubadour," and he'd be like, "Oh shit, I just left." You know, like he thought like he knew us or whatever. <laughs> and then eventually, like he got hip to it, and he put us in his phone as asshole and dickhead, and he like told us this, and then like we we happened to be like out at like Paris Hilton's Fourth of July thing in malibu this was like 2004 i think something like that okay and uh and i saw dave navarro he was like you know getting a turkey burger or whatever the fuck he was doing and i was like yo dave it's asshole and he was like huh and then i was like and this is shithead and he was like oh fuck and like we like hung out with him and he was like so nice and and then like the next week he went on the the radio because we told him that we got his number and we got a lot of the numbers out of like twiggy from Marilyn manson's cell phone because he like passed out this one time and we just like went through his phone and it was like oh shit courtney loves cell phone oh shit you know <laughs> and we just like wrote them all down and so we told him that and he had like jordy or twiggy on like the next week and uh on like indie 103 it was like the local like indie radio station here and uh and he was like yeah i met your friends and they're, they're like really nice he's like i, I had the, <laughs> it was super funny he like told the whole story and shit and that was like one of the better ones because he was just like kind of like a good sport about it. And then he ended up being like so nice that it was like it was almost a bummer how nice he was. It was just like, you know, because we used to call him and be like, Dave, is your shirt off? And he'd be like, yeah, 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 it is. <laughs> you know, and we'd be like, yeah, that's awesome. You know, like 
That's so yeah. great. So it's funny you remind my my buddy John uh, Price. He it's his, today, today's his birthday, and I hit him up with I never let anyone know. Happy who birthday, I'm, John. Yeah, what I, I yeah I never let him. I never let anyone know. So I I, mess, I text him today. I was like, hey dude, my birthday present to you is um um this interview I'm doing today, which I think you're gonna absolutely fucking love because he like he was the one who pretty much would always like he would find any article first and he'd he'd like text it to us back then and it was always like buddy head shit and then he ended up working for like gawker for a while before like oh wow yeah before that like went down but his personality matched like your guys style so perfectly so when you're saying you called and asked him if his shirt was off i'm like guys that reminds me of price like doing that to like everybody (laughs) he's gonna like fucking love this um but cool man yeah i want to um I definitely want to talk a lot about the the website and stuff, and um, but I want to kind of go back and usually, like I said, structure it to go back to like when you were really young and like what started you into music and take it up to really, like probably like mid two thousand or you know because I know Buddy had you guys dissolved in two thousand ten officially. I think it was more like two thousand sixteen because I put out some records in like two thousand fourteen. Oh okay, but the website didn't the, like the the actual site stop i, I mean really, really, really... not really it fluctuated over the years i mean there was even years when i was on tour with nine inch nails where i updated like once a year that was probably like the most inactive like 2005 to 2007 something like that just because i was on tour the whole time and just didn't care oh wow what were you doing on tour were you doing um uh my the guy that i did buddy head with who played guitar in the acres line he ended up playing guitar in nine inch nails holy for a shit while. was that aaron yeah and so i just like like the first show i went to he had like a double suite and uh like with like a door separating it and i was like dude this is like my own apartment you have this every night and he was like yeah because they just were spending so much money it was ridiculous so i just came and like no one really noticed for like the first few weeks and then they were like are you gonna go home and i was like nope (laughs) and then they just like kind of started putting up with it and like we got jokes all the time like oh you guys are married or whatever but it was rad like we were staying in five-star hotels and i had my own room and we were like on a bus it was cool i got to see a lot of things i normally wouldn't know you know like they played places bands normally don't play you know wow that's so fucking crazy dude did you take any photos when you were on that tour yeah a lot yeah a lot that the one of trent with the dildo is yeah. on that tour yeah i was gonna that's, say that's a, like on his birthday we got him the dildo <laughs> yeah as i'm listening check out travis michael keller at um on instagram he's got like a ton of uh photos on there but uh but yeah dude so i want to go back like way back to when you were young and like talk about yeah. you know what was the first time when you were listening to music like what was it, it doesn't have to be punk rock or anything like that but just some music in general when you first heard it and you were like fuck i need to just have this be in my life yeah i mean i think ever since i was like in first grade i had music like but most of it was like stuff that you know it was like pop music or whatever i think the first band that was like mine was when i was like 10 and it was uh, guns and roses appetite for destruction came out yeah and uh, that that was just like a big one for me. And then after that, it was like, you know, Nirvana and like punk kind of at the same time. And you know, saw Nirvana. That was like a big deal. M- Nirvana and Mudhoney were like really heavily in- influential. And like Bikini Kill, all that type of stuff. How old were you when you like was? Because you said you you used to be into skateboarding. Like, did was it skateboarding, and then that led to like listening to like Nirvana? Yeah, and like that, ska- ska- uh, kind of like all at the yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I guess skateboarding. I would go skateboarding with like the the older kids at the college because it's a college town where I grew up, which was crucial because there was actually like outside influence, you know, Uh as opposed to just being like a small town in Idaho. So I would go up to the college and like, you know, find older kids, skate with them. And a couple of those kids passed me like a minor threat CD and like I like never gave it back. You know what I mean? (laughs) So it was like, yeah, through skateboarding and then just skate videos because they were such like a, especially in the 90s, it was like, it was such a a different, like you could get underground music, you know, because there were most people weren't on the internet really. And yeah. even there wasn't much on there. So it was like, and it was always such like a smorgasbord of music too. It'd be like hip hop, like Gangstar, or Nas, and then it'd be like punk. And it, it's like that stuff like really shaped my musical taste, like skateboard videos really. What, um, did you get into photography right on this time or is that later on? Well, yes. Yeah, st- teenage years, I got like a video camera first, started making skateboard videos. Uh, we, we used to like make them and I learned how to edit on like a, down at the cable vision and uh in, in our hometown it was like the public access they had like a non-linear like tape to tape editing machine Jesus. and we we would a- edit like tapes together and then we we my friend drew like covers and we xeroxed them up and we sold them for seven bucks and like like trans world reviewed them and stuff and we sold like hundreds of them out of my parents house and oh, then shit. 
just from that, like I got into photography and it was just like, for that, it was just like kind of like documenting my friends, you know, like what, what we were doing, like pulling tricks and shit like that and like trips we went on. But then, you know, when I moved to LA, <laughs> it was like my friend group switched from like skateboarders to like, and I did work for some skateboard companies when I first got here, but it was just, I think I eventually, I was just like, I'm going on tour. Like this is whatever, you know? And, uh, but my friends group switched to like Igor sign. So it was just like, I just kept documenting what was around me. And it was like the first, the first night I went out in LA was like canker sores, which was like the Igor sign before they changed their name when they were like kids. Uh-huh. And it was at a record store that Joe worked at in Pasadena and it was at the drive-in and they played to like seven people, you know, and I bought like a seven inch from Cedric outside on the sidewalk, you know, and oh it was like, God. and then from there, like, we were kind of like, they're like point, point, you know, like homies in LA for like the first part of their career. And then we ended up having like the same manager as them. So they were kind of like always in our, our sphere after that. And then like the second show I went to was like that record store too. And it was like carp and, and canker sores. So like the dudes in the canker sores, the Igerson, they were always like promoting shows and, and like I met them when they were teenagers, like they came through my town, they were on break from high school. And I was like, who the fuck are these kids? Like, and they're, they have like a record out and like they're, they're in a van by themselves, like no parents. I was like, the fuck, you know? So I was like, I'm going to be friends with them. And when I got here, they were like, not only like playing shows and like getting on like tons of shows, like everything from like, like weird, like, you know, fat records type bands, warp tour bands to like FYP to like everything. And then they were also like promoting shows too. So it was like, I was just kind of like thrown in the middle of like this scene and then also seeing how they were like, kind of like promoting their band and, and just being able to put records out and just do all those things. I just like kind of fell right in the middle of it and started doing all the things they didn't know how to do, which was like, hey, I know how to build a website and fucking, you know, take photos and all that shit. Well, how old were you in this, when this, when you, cause you were you said you grew up in Idaho? Yeah, I grew up in Idaho, and then I moved here when I was 17. Okay, so was it out? Did you move out there just to be in the band, or you just saw them and then eventually? Oh no, I was just like, no, I was already moving. I was just like, I'm getting out of Idaho, so I don't, you know, marry someone I went to high school with and die here. You know what I mean? Like I was just (laughs) like, I'm. To me, like I'd spent a lot of summers in California because my like one of my best friends lives in Sacramento, and I'd been to LA, and to me that was just like the center of music and art and and like skateboarding and like everything that I like liked that where I grew up there, there was no like subculture really where I grew up. It was like kind of like a wasteland, you know? Yeah. So, uh, and it just like didn't get cold, you know? Where in LA did you move to? It's funny. Like I moved to Tarzana and I was like all stoked. I was like, I, you know, I won, I moved to LA. This is awesome. And I like called the dudes in the acres line. I was like, I live in LA. And they were like, where do you live? And I was like, Tarzana. And they're like, that's not LA. You live in the Valley, dude. Dude. And I used I was, to like, live in, fuck. I used to live in Tarzana. Yeah, really? Yeah. I used to live on uh, Reseda yep. and uh, Ventura, like one block toward the freeway right there. I forget what street it's called. There's like a Sharky's on the corner right there. I, oh, my God. I think I remember. That. It, it, is that, I mean, I was there in 2000. I moved there in 2001. I'm pretty and... sure it's still there. Yeah, I was there in 97. Holy but it only for like six months. Okay. Yeah, I remember. Um, yeah, because I, I was right off the 101. Um, I think it was on your, I think it was like. Like it was the 101 and like Reseda was like the exit or DeSoto, and uh, yeah, that's like right where I was. Yeah, crazy. I mean, there was like no one really went to downtown LA until like in the last probably like 10 years because that wasn't like a spot, but like the Valley is where I thought that a lot of people would fucking go or like Hollywood. Yeah, I mean that's where I moved next. That's that's where I went right after that. That was my next apartment, how, Hollywood. So how? And then I was like, "Fuck you guys! Y'all live with your parents still. Fuck you." <laughs> I went from yeah, I went to, I went from Tarzana to Hollywood to Studio City. Yeah, I was like, "I win. Fuck you." <laughs> how long were you in uh, Tarzana before you moved to um, Hollywood? Mm, like six months or so. I got like a job because I like like when I landed here, I like started working at some skate shop because I didn't know anything else. But I'd met this dude on the airplane on the way down. This like he was like a gay dude from West Hollywood, like ran a production company, and he was like, you know, if you ever need a job, call me. And I was like, all right. So I fucking eventually called him, and I started like running tapes for them and like encoding tapes, like you know, digitizing stuff and just going and getting lunch, like whatever. And then I started doing Buddy Head like six months into that job, or maybe just a couple months. And he saw it, and he like saw the potential, and he was like, just do that full time, and I'll still pay you. And, and then he hired Joe, and then he hired a couple of my other friends. 
And he helped us like kind of like start all of that. And like we had like an investor and just this dude that like believed in what we were doing. It was really cool. Wait, was this you know, like, like if we wait, hold on though, because it? you guys like the, I want to like the, the, the timeline here because it was like L.A. That was like right when I started it, like 98. Were you in the Icar- Icarus line? Like were you in? There? I was never. I was never in the Icarus line. I just like put out their first record and like toured with them. Oh. And like okay. I just kind of like did everything else. Okay, so you basically like so like let's kind of go in the, the the order here because Buddyhead was a, was a record label and then you started just writing shit on the website well, after, right? Well, what happened is like we Ickerson like okay, Kanger Stores were a band when I moved here. Yep. And then their drummer died. He's this kid Tim Childs, and he died like on the way home from a rave. The car flipped and he flew out. Jesus. So they changed their name to the Ickerson, and about like the same time I started Buddyhead. Okay. And so so and and uh. Wait, where was I going with this? What was your question? It was just kind of like the timeline. So. Oh yeah, so that's like '98, okay. and it just started as like a site for my photography, and because I couldn't afford like a por- portfolio, and then Iggerslein went on their first tour, which was with Ink and Dagger. They like yeah. literally like kind of talked to him on the phone about it, and then just like showed up in Philly with like all of them in a pickup truck, no <laughs> amps. They just laid down in the back and drove straight out like two days, no stopping to philly showed up and then just like followed the tour basically jesus and like that was their first kind of like tour as the icarus line and then they interviewed in Dagger, and when they got home they were like oh we did this interview and like that was like one of our favorite bands too we were like they were like mythical yeah us, you know? so it was like so i put it up on the site because i came from like the world of fanzines and and all that shit you know so it was like it just seemed natural it was like oh i'll put on the internet like whatever you know and then from there we kind of just started doing other things like that and then record reviews and all the shit and then you know before we knew it, all of our friends were reading it and then like people we didn't know at shows were reading it and then like bands that came from other towns were reading it and then like it like exploded and like everyone in the music industry read it and like people were getting mad and we were getting like millions of hits it was really <laughs> surreal and then around like two years into that, we put out like an Iker sign seven inch and we did like a how we did like a, the first show at the smell and it was called like buddy head Valentine's day massacre. And we gave out to the first 214 people, this seven inch that we pressed. And then after that, we put out ink and daggers record. And then we kind of like started getting demos and became like a real label. But the first two were just like our homies. So like to go back though, like when you started the site, because you had mentioned like earlier in the interview that you were like when your buddy was saying uh, like you would ask people you're like hey I know how to to, how to to like develop websites like sounds like you were just very technical savvy like taking you know it, you kind of figure shit out like editing video shooting video taking photos and then like I mean they're just that's just like how I entertained myself there wasn't much to do where I grew up so it was like I went to the computer lab you know because like all my whole like how I got culture was like mail order or like internet because they're like. There wasn't anything, you know, eventually we had like a cool indie record store, but it was like by the time I was like almost out of high school, you know, so it was like kind of a little too late. But yeah, I just like taught myself how to do websites and and all that shit because in skateboard videos, because that's like that's like how like I entertained myself, really, how I, you know, just didn't go crazy or whatever. Did you have because I also like you sent me a message too on uh, Instagram where you were promoting something and. Like I've been working for myself for like the last 14 years too, and there was something that you said, or I was like, I totally gravitated towards it. You were like, um, what was it? Letting people that I've talked to on here or have left comments and photos know that I'm selling prints of my work. And you were like, uh, no pressure is giving people who showed up interest in the heads up. I'm all about the, on the I'm I'm on my hustle. Print them all. So it was like I totally appreciated that because like I love seeing people just do shit for their for themselves. And it seems like you pretty much have started that at 17 and like just didn't fucking stop. I mean, I've definitely had, thanks for saying that. That means a lot. Uh, Yeah, it's all. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely had jobs throughout here and there for different reasons. Like, and even like three years ago, I was kind of like trying to figure out what I was doing. And like, you know, I had a bunch of shit jobs. I worked in a couple bars. And like, I even before that, I worked in a fucking dog hotel where I just picked up dog shit for eight hours. But I mean, yeah, it's fluctuated throughout. But, you know, it's it's also been, like, it's been a good ride, for sure. But did you say, like, when you moved to L.A., was that your vision to just, like, did you have an idea when you moved No, there? I had no, I had no vision at all. Even, like, when we started Buddyhead, there was, like, no vision, you know? It, it was just, like, this is what we do kind of thing. <laughs> there was never really, like, an attack plan or any of that. And then uh, once Buddyhead got going, I was just kind of able to, like, ride the wave, I guess, you know? There wasn't much planning. I think what I loved about it, though, is that I think the most what I consider success is anyone who's just putting out what their own 
what they feel is just like natural. And it seems like you kind of like did that with the site. It was your own passion of just like, hey, man, this is just what I think is funny. Or this is why I want to entertain myself. And that's like, I'm not doing this for anybody else. Yeah, for sure. It was just like, I mean, we kind of like weren't really accepted into any scene, like as the Icker sign and all that. So we kind of like, once Buddy had started taking off, we kind of like built our own with like the label and just kind of the aesthetic and, and the bands we associated with were also kind of like misfit bands, I feel like. Yeah. Do you remember the first post that you had on there that just like went ape shit? Uh, I I feel like it was, I mean, there was a few, like it just depends. Like, yeah, I guess maybe like the rules of rock was probably like one of the first like really big ones where like mainstream media started like reposting it and we were like, what the fuck, you know? How are they finding it? There was only like five music websites on the internet at the time. No one had Facebook. No one had, you know what I mean? There was only like so many, it was just getting a lot of hits because it was like one of the only music sites, you know? And the other ones were trash, you know? They were either like super corporate or just like not that cool. Did you ever feel like nervous when you were posting something? You were like, I don't know if I should do this, but then you did it and it just went crazy and you were like, okay, I, it, but like it got like, backlash for it but you were like i didn't give a fuck for sure i mean we said a lot of really dumb things but we would like kind of egg each other on i mean especially when we started getting punched in the face a couple times then it was always like <laughs> jesus all right do we really need to make fun of that band like is it worth it, it was more like was more the like the thought process you know <laughs> like like <laughs> is it really that funny and if, if it was that funny then it was like okay fine post it you know but like, like the two times i got punched in the face were things i didn't write so both times I was like, what the fuck, man? Like, and it wasn't even that funny, you know? Like, the one time I got punched was the dude from the transplant showed up. I went to the Plea for Peace show at the El Rey. Yeah. And, like, Alkaline Trio played because we were, like, friends with them. And I walked out from backstage, and this dude was like, are you are you the buddyhead guy? And I was like, yeah, thinking he was going to be, like, your site's rad. And he just, like, punched me in the face, like, nine times. Jesus. And I was just like, I'm not going to fight you. And he had, like, a, he was with a dude, like, in a mad ball sweatshirt. <laughs> And uh, I was like, yeah, dude, I'm, these guys are going to waste me no matter what. I was like, get it over with. <laughs> but yeah, and, and that was like, I think the post just said like, good Charlotte sucks, which is like kind of a fact, you know, and like not funny at all. It's like, yeah. that's what I got punched for. Really? It's like, so yeah. But yeah, sometimes it was more <laughs> like, is it worth it more than anything? But yeah, I mean, after a while too, it was just like, well, we've said so much crazy shit. Go for it. You know? Did you like grow up? Were you a writer at all in like high school or when you were a kid? Mm, not really. Like I barely went to high school. Like I skipped out on high school the whole time, but I did get interested in writing through like skateboarders that were writing like in Thrasher and stuff. This dude, Steve Barra, who became like an actor and he runs like the barracks and stuff. He used to write like the intros to like trans worlds and stuff. And they were always kind of like sappy, like about life and shit, not really about skateboarding. Like I really, I was like, I'm trying to like really dissect like how you go from like, I really, I'm just so fascinated about just like that scene in general, but this is so interesting to me because it's like just little pieces here and there just like kind of come together. And it's like, what was the thing, the perfect storm that made this website? And it just sounds like, you know, you had a big passion for just creating your own shit. And like, I mean, we were kind like, of in the middle of something cool too, you know, like, you know, I had unlimited access to this like small punk scene, you know, it was like my friends were putting on the shows, you know, we were peers with all the bands that were playing, um, do you know what I mean? Like, like, so we had the access to that. And so we kind of just started documenting it. And like, cause a lot of those bands weren't getting like m mainstream music press. Do you know what I mean? And we yeah. came from like the world of like putting our own shows on, you know, you make the flyer, you hand them out outside another show, like put your own record out, uh, you know, book your own tour. Do you know what I mean? So like we, we that was kind of like the intent was just to kind of shed light on bands that weren't really, we felt getting attention and and just kind of like documenting like our, our world, you know, and then yeah. it like obviously got bigger from there. And we started like, you know, talking shit on mainstream bands because, you know, why not? It's fun. Did you build the site from scratch or was it on like WordPress? Was WordPress? No, it was then? before WordPress. It was all HTML. Wow. Jesus Christ. So you're like just open this thing up and just like just going to town and writing shit. And mm -hmm. well, I mean, it would take it. It would take us a long time because it's like it wasn't like WordPress. So it was like. We didn't update like every day. We would do like an issue every month. So it'd be like, so we would like um, make a board and be like, okay, we're going to interview fucking hot snakes or we're going to interview this dude or, 
whatever, this dude's going to put some of his photos up for an art feature or like whatever. We would have like articles basically. And then we would just bang them out. And then, you know, once they were like proofed and all that shit, we would send them just, like, we had a couple of kids that would design with me mm-hmm. and they'd get, you know, Hey, will you do this one? Yep. Hey, will you, you know, cause they were all just doing it for like the love, you know, they're like a couple of them were kids that were like in high school still, you know, that lived like far away that were just like fans, you know? Yeah. And so we would all lay it out and then like, you know, at the stroke of midnight or whatever, we would put the whole thing up. So it would be like a whole issue of like whatever, 15 different like articles or interviews or the gossip or a section of record reviews, you know? So it was like an issue is the way we kind of did it just because it took a lot of fucking work back then, you know? Yeah. Especially for code. Like I know we had to do HTML and all that. And that was like but just a, everything. Yeah. Just computers were slower. Do you know what I mean? Like getting a photo <laughs> into a computer was way fucking harder. You know what I mean? Like yeah. everything was harder. You had to FTP it once you were done. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> oh, like God, that's right. It, it took a long time. Like we spent hours doing all, of it. but it was like kind of from the same world as you know making zines and and flyers and you know being at Kinkos and all that. So. So I told a buddy that I was going to interview you, and he goes, "Did you know that Buddyhead was one of the first websites to do it horizontally?" I think we were the first. Is that because you wanted to make it like zine style? I think we just thought it looked cool. Like I think, I think someone did it for one of the layouts, and I was like, "How do you do that?" And she showed me. This girl Emily did it, but I think we were the first. That was the first time I'd ever seen it. Yeah, it seems like you were kind of just be like right, like a zine was just you know, just like a magazine. Yeah, that's like one of the coolest it. layouts we ever did. I loved that. When did you guys change it? I think we had we had it a bunch of different times. Really? Yeah, it was like it was just kind of like a greatest hits. I would always bring it back, but yeah, I mean, we just try to keep it interesting too, you know. So we would change it up. Did you ever get to Go a point to where routes. did you ever put it onto like a WordPress thing, like later on? Yeah, yeah, like later on, I did. Like, fuck, I don't even know what year. Like 2006, maybe. This dude Meathead, he like helped me import it all. That's okay. his name, Meathead. He like drew drew cartoons for us and stuff. He runs like a Nine Inch Nails fan site. So yeah. He put it all into WordPress for us. Shout out to Meathead. Took forever. I read something on, it was like an interview you did, or it was on like Wikipedia, where there was, you guys were really good at prank calling people and recording it. And there was like a person, like a, a surname that they used. What was that? Oh, Torture Device? Torture Device. And it says to this day, and again, when I read it, it was like you were interviewed in 2010. It might have been a little later and said to this day, like, you guys won't say who it was. I can't. I'm trying to get him to do it again. And he's like, he's like a big wig, dude. If I told you, you'd laugh. You know what I mean? Like, I can't. He's not like famous, but like, he works with famous people. (laughs) And he's a fucking boss. He's fucking awesome. He's like one of the funniest people I know. And we've been talking about doing stuff recently. So I can't, I can't say. I can't say. So what was like a day in the life like back then when, you know, the the, the, the label's going, um, the site's, it's like starting to take off. Like what would that look like back then? Um, well, it depends on like what year really. Like we had an office in the CNN building up until about 2002. And then we moved it. Like the dude that, the dude that kind of funded us and stuff, he ended up just giving it all to, to me. And so then I got a house in Hollywood on Wilcox and Melrose and a couple of the members of the Acre Sign lived there with me, and we kind of like moved it into the front room. There was like a big, de- a couple desks and shit, and uh, we had like interns and shit. But really, it was Jesus Christ. Yeah, it, but it was like all like in the house too, you know. And it kind of depended because a lot of times I would go on tour with them, so there would be like nothing happening. You know, we'd just be on tour, you know. And it was kind of like before, you know, it was harder to get online back then. So it wasn't like when you were on tour, you were kind of on tour except for like maybe a few times you'd get to check in. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't yeah. like you're connected all the time like you are now. So how, like, so you you guys were, you were literally making like a living off the site. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, at first we had like this dude funding it, you know, he was like running a production company and he right. would just like throw money into it, you know, hoping to sell it or whatever. And, uh, and then when he gave it to me, uh, I ended up getting lucky and the truth.com, advertised on our site they we signed like a deal for like five years and it was like something like 40 grand a year so wow. just that and then we were selling like t-shirts and we got a couple label deals and stuff like that so i mean it wasn't rich but i was able to keep doing what like what i needed to do and we were able to like give bands money to record and put records out and stuff like that that's fucking awesome jesus christ 
So, like, when you were getting funded and all that, was there ever a point, you know, like, I kind of keep going back to the whole thing with, because the stuff you guys put out was so, I mean, it was, like, jaw-dropping to us back then, because it, it always started with, dude, you got to hear what fucking Buddyhead just said. Like, that was always the way it would start, and we were like, Jesus Christ, and it was like, here's, you know, Fred Durst was, like, a huge target for you guys, it seemed. Like, it was like, here's his address, here's his email, it was, like, all this information. <laughs> really you know, and this is, this is a really funny story on that. Yeah. So like years later, like, I don't even know what year, but like late 2000s, I met this girl and she was like, I've got to tell you, you ruined my life for like three years. She was like, I was a receptionist at Fred Durst's office. <laughs> and cause like when we put his number up, it was like, yeah, we put his cell phone up, but he'd like change it right away. But he had this work number and it was like the main Interscope number. And you like this one number, it would just be like a alphabetical directory. So you would just type in D-U-R. And it would like go right to his desk, like they couldn't change it. You know what I mean? It was like, and she said like for like three years she got like two hundred to three hundred calls, just like, hey, can you tell Fred Durst he's fat? <laughs> you know, it was like she was just like, dude, it was insane. I was like, you should have quit. What made him a target for you guys? I mean, they were like the biggest band in the world. It was insane. It was just like it's, it seemed like a Saturday Night Live sketch to us. You know, we were just like so rigid and punk and just like you know what i mean it was like the opposite it was like this jock dude playing like rap rock you know it was just like sacrilege to us you know what i mean it was just dumb like we just couldn't believe it was like this is america you know <laughs> was it like something where you guys would always get together and kind of have a discussion before you did put this up or someone would just do it and you're like they're like oh that's no nah, it was just someone would just take the lead yeah you know and then it would be like you know, a lot of it was col like we would collaborate on stuff, but someone would like start it or whatever and it would go back and forth just because things took so long to go up that we just like, you know, make it bulletproof. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was uh, I think one of the uh, I think it was the John Mayer thing that I, I let in with you with you. But there was another story I was telling a few interviews ago where when this one comes out, I think it'll probably be like six before prior to this one. But there was uh, I was talking to this guy, Alex, who was a roadie for Midtown. And we were talking about how they flipped their van back in like the 90s. And um, I was like, yeah, I remember there was a whole time period where it was like Midtown, Saves a Day, um, like two other bands. And then all these bands kept flipping. And that's what I brought you guys up because I was like, I remember hearing that you guys had written this thing. It was like all these bands keep flipping their vans. It's like I think even God hates shitty music. <laughs> That's rough. And, and I'm telling him this, and he was in the van, and he started laughing. He was like, that's fucking amazing. <laughs> I was like, you guys have had no fucking, like, filter. That was, like, incredible. Was there ever, like, were you ever concerned, like, with, you know, because there was never, like, there was never photos of you guys, I thought, out there. Uh, No, there was. We used to always put them on the, the best and worst list. Um, And there was, like, always, like, a staff page, too. There was, our photos were always on there. Oh, really? Yeah. Did you ever like get kind of nervous about that? Um, yeah, I mean later on, I, only when I got punched in the face, really. That was like there was just like a like a six months period where it was a little stressful. We like we pissed off some like hardcore dudes that were like friends with Good Charlotte, and that was like a little weird. But other than that, not really. It was always kind of like we're just being honest. Like you got you know here, here's what we look like. I think it says that on a couple of the best of lists. It's like here's what we look like. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. So like when you were. Like, how long did it have, like, it, did it really last where it was just riding this wave? Like, how many years did that go for? A uh, long time. Yeah. Long time. <laughs> I mean, it was, like, really popular. Like, it started in, like, I don't know. We started in 98, but it probably got popular around, like, 2000, I would guess. Uh, Iker Sign signed to a major label in 2003. And then, I mean, it was still big even when I was touring Nine Inch Nails. I just never updated it, you know, and then it kind of, like, waned in like 2007 i guess and then i kind of like relaunched it in like 2009 2010 something like that and then they put me on the cover of the la weekly and that kind of had like another renaissance and then i put out like a bunch more records and kind of focused more on the label side and like kind of like positive music stuff i guess was still like interviews and shit yeah but i guess i still did the gossip even then up until about 2014 i think but yeah i mean fucking most of my adult life which is crazy i should have thought of a better name you know, if I would have known it was going to last that long. Oh, for Buddyhead? Yeah. Yeah, you know. <laughs> How'd you come up with a name anyway? Even though it's like the lamest question, I just have to know. Uh, I was just, we needed a name for a site, and I was passing this like grade school in West Hollywood, and the kid called me a Buddyhead. 
and I just like didn't even think of it and thought it would only be like a temporary site. And then here we are talking about it like 20 plus years later. <laughs> <laughs> Who came up with the, the icon with the gun facing backwards? Uh, Born Against did. And then I think before that, they stole it from a Polish joke book. Okay. So we just we just stole it off the Born Against CD artwork. So I was reading too, like, so the record label, you guys put out stuff by, like, you had, what at the drive-in? Really uh, we did a out? seven inch with them and the Murder City Devils. It was like the last thing they put out before they broke up. Holy it was shit. like a two songs, and it was remixed by the Latch Brothers, which is this dude Tick and Mike D from uh, Beastie Boys. Holy crap! Oh, that's right, because they were in Grand Royale. Yeah, yeah, it was like the Grand Royal era. It was toward the end, though. Okay. Like when you get, when you were signing bands back then, like how'd you do it? Um, I mean, it varied really. Sometimes it was like a handshake. We had a couple contracts. Um. I mean, for a while, we, like, played by the rules, and then it was just, like, whatever, man. Like, we had, like, like Fred Durst, we we put out this uh, Revolution Smile record, or we were going to, and it was, like, one of the dudes from Far, and, like, I, I ended up, like, you know, sequencing the record, getting it laid out, like, I took it to Capitol, master it, all that stuff, paid for it all, and then they took that record, because we didn't have a contract, and they put it on a Fred Durst label, like, he, like, signed them to, like, fuck with us. Oh, wow. And after that, it was kind of like, well all right, like, I, I kind of just did, like, handshakes after that. It was just kind of like, whatever, man, um, if you didn't want to be on the label. It wasn't like we were – I kind of knew we weren't ever going to, like, make the million dollars. Do you know what I mean? So it was like we were just putting out weird shit that didn't really have a home. So it was like if someone wanted to leave, they could fucking leave was always my philosophy. Was this around the time when uh, Napster was starting to come around? Yeah, Napster was, like, what, like 2001? Something like that, like 2001, 2002, I think. yeah. Did you find that that had any kind of effect on you guys? I mean, yeah, because people were buying less vinyl at the time, for sure. But, I mean, every it's just it's always changing, I feel like, you know? Like, uh, that definitely was a weird era, though, just because, like, anyone could get anything. But it was also, like, super exciting. Like, I don't know. I don't think of it, it affected it right away. But down the road, yeah, then we just, like, basically couldn't sell any vinyl. We went from, like, you know pressing like you know nine thousand or whatever it was of the at the drive-in seven inch and like you know five thousand of the ink and dagger record to like you know barely be able to do a thousand to like not being able to just doing digital releases and like cds and like limited stuff you know jesus but Maybe, i mean it took yeah. it wasn't like right away you know it was like 10 years later that it kind of took an effect on us because we were kind of like a boutique we had like a niche you know so we were able to hang on for a little bit longer but uh but yeah, I mean, fuck yeah, everything changed. Now there's really no need for labels, you know? It's like the internet's a label. Well, I mean, vinyl's like huge now. It's like... Yeah, for sure. Was there any like crazy, I don't know, were there any like crazy articles you guys put on the site that you remembered that was like one of your favorites? My favorites. I like a lot of the interviews we've done. Like I've been going, I'm starting to do like a, an archive book of the site. So I'm just kind of dipping my toe in it. I haven't really started yet, but I've been pulling a few things off a hard drive and looking at them and some of the interviews are really good actually i was kind of thought i was going to be embarrassed and rereading them is like ah oh, these are pretty solid man um i don't know i always like the funny stuff like rules of rock is still pretty funny and uh fuck i don't know i just read the mike d interview i did and it's pretty fucking solid thought it was pretty good for a 20 year old kid i asked some good 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 questions like how did you prepare for that shit back then when there was there was no internet i was just like a super fan like, I just knew shit, you know what I mean? Like, and there was the internet, you know, it was just like, you know, you just look at, or you just ask people, like, you know, I had friends that were friends with Mike, so it was like, I just asked them shit, I think. But I was also, like, a massive Beastie Boys fan from the time I was, like, a teenager, so it was pretty fucking easy. <laughs> yeah, I was, like, surprised, like, I couldn't do it now, I'll tell you that. Like, I couldn't do it. I was reading the interview, I was like, dude, I was fucking on my game. Like, I asked some questions I didn't even remember asking. I was really? like, good, good on me. <laughs> Where'd you get like the, where'd you get like the kind of like, I don't know, the don't give a, not don't give a fuck attitude. Like, how'd you get like such like, I don't know, the balls to do this shit back then? Did you just like seriously just not care? No, it was kind of like the Icarus line and my friends, like when I moved here, like I was like super naive and like really sweet and nice. <laughs> and they just like basically berated me and made fun of me until like I became like who I am now. <laughs> <laughs> Were they ever like, shit, man, what do we create? <laughs> No, I mean, I think we're, I think, I think I just became more like them. You know, I was just from Idaho and shit, you know, and they're, they all grew up here. So they're, they were always just like a little bit tougher and a little bit more ahead of the curve, you know? 
Yeah. Do you ever like? You know, and then it all evened out. You know, the older we get, you know. But do you ever get kind of like over the whole like buddy head thing following you, or you still? It seems like I don't know. It seems like you're still like down with it. Uh yeah, I mean for years I kind of hated it, especially like I don't know like like 2014 15 it really felt like a burden it was like the last like four or five years i did i should have stopped it way before i did it was just like every time i had to update it i was like oh, i fucking hate this shit like it almost felt like i was doing homework and it became really unfun but now that i've had a break from it and like and it's and now it's kind of allowing me to have like kind of like a second life and like now all these photos that i kind of took secondary not really secondary but it wasn't like ever my main focus you know it was just like oh, i take photos too you know and now because of it, I'm kind of able to like live and sell my photos and put out zines and there's people that care and like reconnecting with those people. And like, that's what's cool about Instagram for me. Like I actually really like Instagram. Everyone talks about how awful it is. And I have such a good experience because it's just connecting with all these people that like this thing that I did, like they'll tell me that it like affected their life positively, you know, and they got that like they got into all this music or because of it, like it gave them confidence to do this. And, you know, they always do something kind of cool. It's, they're always like creative people. And it's kind of neat to like, know that we did something that meant a lot to a lot of people, you know, like yeah. there's very few like fair weathered buddy head fans. They're like, Oh yeah, I've heard of that. You know, they're always like, dude, I fucking love that shit, you know? And that's, that's fucking cool, you know? So I kind of like have come back around to like loving it in this weird way. Now it's like, and kind of like rereading some of it too. It's like, yeah, it's fucking rad. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And like, and just even like looking at my photos and, and going through my zines and shit and like remembering all the shit I did and we did and all that stuff. Like I'm proud of it and it's a cool story and, and yeah, man, you know? Yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of into it again, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, I think I, I in a couple things, like I, I think I like it a lot because it was just genuine. You know, it wasn't contrived at all. It was just like, you know, people who were super passionate about music in general. And it came through like it came through. It was like with, you guys were writing about shit because it's like even on here, it's like, you know, you guys were sued by. I don't know how much is true. It's like Corn, Courtney Love, Fred Durst, Drive Through. Oh, yeah, it's all true. Yeah. Axel Rose. Like multiple times, was... too. Like a lot. Like Drive Through, like five or six times we got sued. Like our lawyer was like always fielding that shit, but he was rad too. He was just like into it, you know, and he got so many clients from it because he talked to everybody because of us. Really? But I mean, for like, you know, defending us, but then he would like get clients with whoever was like fucking with us because he was such a good lawyer. Yeah. I remember you guys were always on drive throughs like Target. Yeah. Because they, they had like beef with me because they like used to hire me. Like when I first moved to LA, like a lot of the photo shoots I did, like they hired me on like three or four. Like I even found photos the other day where like, They'd flown me to New York to shoot Newfound Glory. Like, I don't have the actual photos, but I just noticed they're on their first record. And I think I gave them the negatives. But I have a photo of me and them, like, walking to the shoot that I found. And I was like, oh, right. I forgot I shot photos of that band. What, like, what flipped? Uh, I mean, they just hired me. You know, I didn't really know them or nothing. They were just like, you know, do you want to go to New York for 900 bucks? And I was like, yeah, my friends are out there. You know, I, went, I like, got flown out there to shoot, like, a couple rolls of film, you know. And then... uh. And then I just never talked to him again, and they got famous. I don't know. I wasn't like a fan or anything. No, like what would like what put drive through on the on the radar for like a lot of lawsuits? Like what was the things you were? Oh, like, I mean, the... they just put out really bad music. I don't know. Like we were just like, and they were like weirdos. I don't know. I can't really remember to be honest. Yeah. Just put out bad music. For the, that's that's all that it really takes. <laughs> yeah, it's like see if like someone did like a carnal sin. You're like fuck that. <laughs> Yeah, they were just an easy target. I was surprised um, when we connected that, you know, I mean, the whole podcast thing, I just got into it just because I wanted to talk about that scene. And I was, I always hear about like people who get interviewed on podcasts that never even thought about doing one. Like, have you ever thought about starting one? Um, yeah, I did one like a couple years ago. And, you know, I th I've been thinking about doing one. I've just been so busy with everything else. Um, I did one for like in 2014. I probably did like 20 of them. They're out there. I interviewed, like, Henry Rollins and, like, Steve Albini and shit. It was kind of like the death oh, wow. rattle of Buddyhead. Yeah. Um, but, like, no one heard it. <laughs> like, they, like, barely got any listens. It was discouraging. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't very good at the podcasting. But I've been thinking about doing one. I just need to – I need a sidekick, you know? Yeah, I need man. someone to motivate me. What was the point where Aaron left the label? Uh, it was after Nine Inch Nails. He did, like, a, a tour with Jubilee that just, like, fell apart and – and then he had like mental problems. I mean, you know as much as I do if you've read anything online. No. Because he actually. basically just stopped like talking to me at one point. Oh really? And then like I haven't talked to him in ten years. 
but yeah, I mean, I guess he went crazy and now he's on psych meds and, and all that, but he doesn't, it's not just me. He doesn't really talk to anybody, you know, like we saw him at Alvin, the guitar player from Ikerson's funeral. And like, he didn't talk to any of us, you know? So like, I don't, I don't really know. I've read the articles online though. That's where I got my info. Oh wow. Jesus. So like, what do you, like, what's the main thing you're up to these days? Just like, cause I see like you're selling the photography, you got merch. Yeah, I'm doing that. Selling shirts with my photos on them, uh, selling zines. And then as American Primitive, me and Joe, who used to sing in the Icarus line and our buddy Jacob were like an art collective and, and Joe runs a studio where he records his own solo music and stuff. And we've been making videos. Like we just did the last Mark Lanigan video. And uh, Jimmy the cab driver from MTV Fame's in it. Oh which wow! Was a, yeah. a childhood dream. <laughs> he brought his character back for us, so that was like a huge win. It was just like 14 year old me would be stoked. Oh my god! But yeah, we've been making videos and 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 that kind of stuff. We're working on a short film with actually the dude that plays Jimmy, this actor Donnell, and uh, that's going to be really cool. It's kind of like, and we've got a couple other scripts on a movie that we want to make this year, and uh, yeah, we're really kind of getting into telling stories that way. And I'm also going to start working on a buddy head kind of like archive book that could be like a scrapbook. Basically, like if someone's never seen it or ever saw it, you could hand it to them and they would understand like what buddy head was and, oh my God. and all that. You know, almost like a greatest hits with like kind of the story told and some like photos and all that shit. Um, I just got to kind of get to the place where I want to like dig through old shit that much because it's, it's, it's a lot of work. But yeah, this year I think I want to try to do that, and you know I've also got like 300 hours of videotapes that I've got to get digitized so we can make some kind of like cocksucker blues type movie because <laughs> I've got footage of everything. It's it's rad. Yeah, the whole digitizing process sucked. Like my old band, my drummer gave me like a ton of VHS tapes, and I'm like, how do I do this? And someone's like, oh, you have to get like a VHS player and hook it up to your computer. I'm like, that sounds like fucking awful. Yeah, ours is even harder because it's like mini DV and it's like a certain type of camera that's like obscure. So, okay. but we're getting closer to it. Someone's lending us a tape deck. That'll also happen this year. Yeah, Joe's working on a new record. He's putting out a second solo record. And then when that comes out, we'll be making like videos for it. Like this last record last year, we made like five videos for his stuff. And you can see all those on our website, AmericanPrimitive.org. Nice. But yeah, he's uh, finishing up his second record, and and then hopefully when that comes out, we'll we'll get to play some shows around the world. And because uh, he doesn't have a band now, he just it's just like him and Beats. So me and Jacob are usually the band. We usually come and just take photos and and make sure shit runs smooth. That's awesome. What yeah, um? 2019. <laughs> so you have like you literally have all of the like articles you've written. It just in a hard or, like just in a save somewhere. Yeah, I just got them on a couple hard drives, and then I've got, like, wow. hard copies of some of it. At some point, I printed out the site, so I've got, like, a stack of it, like, printed out if I need, like, a backup. Have you ever just thought of just, like, printing a few of them, just taking photos and put on your Instagram just to kind of get some buzz going? Yeah, I mean, I have been, like, on my stories and stuff. Like, when people ask for them, I'll, like, dig one up. Like, I did the Hot Snakes interview the other day, and I did the Mike D one, and then I did, like, the Vincent Gallo interview. Oh, wow. Um, but I'm kind of not like keeping them up there just because I'm going to drop the book and just be like, you know. But yeah, I've been I've been putting bits and pieces up there. And like whenever people want to ask me shit about it, I definitely I'm definitely open to talk about it. But I think once I start like digging into that stuff, I might as well just like get down and like make a book, you know. Yeah, man. I feel I feel kind of dumb just like throwing it up on Instagram. I got to like make some stuff. And right now I'm just finishing up another zine because I've been doing all these like questions on my Instagram. Uh -huh. where people ask me shit and I'm going to do like a little book of those because they kind of tell a story and some of them are kind of cool. So I'm going to, I'm going to do like a little cheap zine of all the, all my favorite ones. Yeah. I've been seeing that. Like you have like the ask me shit and, uh, yeah, I think it'll be cool. Cause it's, it's something that comes from like a disposable, like internet site, you know, and it's like to make something physical out of that. It's kind of cool. And I don't know if I've seen that before. So yeah. I'm kind of excited about that one. Yeah, man. I mean, you have like, you obviously have a fucking style for writing. So I think, uh, yeah, <laughs> or lack of, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I love, I love the one story. Ask you shit. Why don't you follow Fred Durst? Because weak content. <laughs> I mean, I was just like, dude, I don't follow a lot of people. I don't, I don't know. Sometimes I just don't even know what to say. It's hilarious, dude. Yeah, anyone like listen, you gotta go follow him because the the story is part's amazing. What's the dude with the the drugs up thing that's up there right now? He's like in a hospital or something. Who? who? It was oh, like it's oh, on your story. Kid, the yeah, I was lit kid. 
Yeah. Yeah, you to, go, yeah YouTube Dubai was lit, dude. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> it's like this kid on like uh, – like laughing gas and he's like talking shit to his mom and he's like saying how he was like in dubai with hookers and it was lit and all this stuff and they're like who are you there with and he's like rocco my friend rocco and they're like who's rocco and he's like rock em, sock em. It's sick dude you gotta watch it it's funny <laughs> but he just like rambles and like starts cussing at his mom and shit like for like 10 minutes it's really funny oh my god it's awesome, man. It's, well, one of the, it's one of the better parts of the internet right there yeah the internet is pretty good for some things and pretty awful for some other <laughs> shit um, right Cool, man. Well, well, thanks for thanks for talking to me, man. Yeah, dude. Um, let me just uh, I asked two more questions before oh, okay. I let everyone cool. off. Um, so, but you did it a couple times, but I figured just have you do it again. So, what what do you want to plug before I ask the last question? Uh, fuck. I would just say go look at my shit on online because it changes all the time. Uh, you know, check out my shit if you like it. Awesome. <laughs> 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 it's like you're not doing a commercial travis it's like oh fuck right no gotcha. you, no mate do a commercial be like go to this website go to that website uh yeah our site's americanprimitive.org that's where all our shit is for the most part except for the mark lanigan video that's not up yet okay. but yeah american primitive is kind of like the the place where like you can find out about joe's music and like the videos we're making and my zine our shirts and all that shit it's kind of like the new buddy head for lack of a better word all right, one last question. Um, I don't know that's going to go down. So what, what scene ethics do you still hold on to to this day? Um, I mean, just same thing I've always done. is just like trying to be like true to myself, but also like keep growing and like learning and like being a better person kind of, you know, like getting better at all this shit, you know. Yeah. But like at the same time, like remembering like why I do things and like, you know, to like stay happy is like the most important thing to me. And like, you know, kind of be like – the boss of my own shit, I guess. Yeah, that's awesome. But yeah, just to stay like true and like just be real, you know, not be like don't fake the funk. But at the same time, like get paid because that's something I never did before. <laughs> like <laughs> I always like ran for money, and I don't know why. You know, that was like something that like the scene taught me that I wish it wouldn't have. That was like, or at least I maybe I misinterpreted it, you know. Interesting. But that was something that I took from it. It was that like money was bad or evil. But I think like if it's done rightly and on your own terms fucking it's powerful you know so like i, I guess that's where i stand on that 